Здравейте и добре дошли. А, започваме като начало на български, след което ще преминем и на английски язик, който е официалния, а, официалния език на днешната дискусия. А, от името на Гьот Институт бихме искали да ви а, приветстваме към тази дискусия по пазолини политически визии. Това е една дискусия, която организираме в навечерието на откриването на 26-та седмица на съвременното изкуство в Пловди, в която тази година е на тема а, по, а, по пазолини съвременни визии с куратори Бетина Штайнбрюга и Бенямин Фелман. Сега преминавам на английски. Останете с нас, за да чуете повече за изложбата, но за да поговорим също така и за наследството на големия италиански режисьор Пьер Пауло Пазолини, за, неговите, за неговото изкуство, филми и за неговите политически, политически идеи. Now, as I said, I'm uh, switching to English and I would like to uh, welcome you again on behalf of the Goethe Institute Bulgaria. Um, we are very ho- uh, we are very happy to host uh, this uh, this uh, discussion just a day before the opening of the 26th week of contemporary art in Plovdiv organized by the Art Today Association and curated this year by uh, Bettina Steinbrugger and Benjamin Fehrman. Um, we are very happy to be partner of, uh, of this event, which is opening tomorrow, the 4th of September at 7 p.m. in Banja Starinna in Plovdiv. The exhibition will be on view until 4th of October this year. So if you have the chance, don't forget to visit Plovdiv and to visit the exhibition. And the curators and the organizers will also try to put some more um, content online. So keep posted to see uh, maybe virtual virtual guided tours, more talks, etc. So I'm now giving the floor to Benjamin Fellman, uh, who is uh, not only curator of the week, but also moderator of the, uh, of the discussion. And don't forget that you can, uh, you can comment and ask questions at any time in the Facebook event uh, under this post as a, as a comment to this post. So enjoy. Thank you very much for the introduction and a very warm welcome to all online participants on behalf of Bettina Steinbrugge and myself too. My name is Benjamin Fellman, as said, and together with Bettina, who is here with us as a participant in the discussion, I was invited by the Center of Contemporary Art Plovdiv to develop the exhibition project that is to open at the ancient bath in Plovdiv for the week of contemporary art of the Art Today Association headed by Emil Murashev, whose name should be named here too, a member of Goethe's Institute's International Network of German Cultural Societies Abroad tomorrow under the title After Pasolini, Visions of Today. And this exhibition brings together a total of 16 Bulgarian and international artistic positions that are either inspired by, work on or with the life and works of the great Italian filmmaker, poet, writer, critic and political activist, Pier Paolo Pasolini. And we are very glad and happy that it can take place this year with the support from Goethe Institute. And it also brings us together today, here right now, at the invitation of the Goethe Institute in Sofia, for a more general discussion that we tentatively titled Political Visions Today, against the background of the ex- exhibition in Plovdiv, and as well an upcoming exhibition on political art planned by the Goethe Institute Sofia. It is very unfortunate that the corona difficulties on traveling made it impossible that we, are, that we all meet at the Goethe Institute in Sofia in person today, But we have the advantage that we can all come together here in this way and also allow people who cannot attend right now to have a look later. We want to talk today about, first, the relevance of Pier Paolo Pasolini today and how he was perceived until today in different cultural contexts, especially also in Bulgaria. I think that to this, it is relevant to briefly give a very short introduction to Pasolini who can be roughly characterized as one of the most important cultural figures in post-war Italy, but also Europe, with influences that continue to be felt today. He was born in 1922 and was killed in November 1975, which makes 2020 the year that marks his 45th anniversary of his death. He began his career as an award-winning poet and novelist in the 1940s and 1950s, with poems like The Ashes of Gramsci, and novels like Ragazzi di Vita and A Violent Life, Una Vita Violenta. He was a scriptwriter for film directors like Federico Fellini and Mauro Bolognini before he began to direct his own productions, films that quickly became world famous 
and took an international importance, such as to name just a few, Akatone, Evangelo Secondo Matteo, the Gospel according to St. Matthew, Theorema, the Trilogy of Life, or his last, Salo, or the 120 Days of Sodom. His films, articles, and fiction developed a critique of the consumer culture that began to take Italy in the late 1960s, and he was a politically outspoken artist who was always in opposition, and often enough united in himself contradictory positions. He was a character with many facets and perspectives. Pasolini united in himself a deep leftist communist conviction with a critical distance towards the Communist Party. On the one hand, a criticism of the institution of the Catholic Church with religious feelings on the other, an anti-modernist orientation towards language and archaic forms of life with avant-gardistic artistic work, an engagement with leading intellectual figures of his time with seeking out communal forms of social life on the poor peripheries of the metropole, a take on the narrative canon of myth and literature with a glowing interest in the third world in his work. Now, in a second term in this discussion, we want to address what it means for contemporary art and society to take Pasolini as a starting point to develop politically informed works. Pasolini touches upon topics such as to name only a few that we reference in the outline for this exhibition, but that are ex absolutely not exclusive. Modernization, commercialization, forced mobility, communal forms of coexistence, the question of how to live right, a search for purity and truth, the third world as a future, the relation between the South and the North in Italy, in Europe and in global terms. And all of these, I guess, are topics that perhaps feel more relevant today than ever. And then in a third term, but also more generally in this discussion, we want to speak about what the relevance of politically informed and politically engaged art in society can or could be today. And for this, we are very grateful to welcome two experts to the discussion together with Bettina, which is Stanimir Panayotov, who is a Bulgarian philosopher, and Fabien Vitali, who was born in Switzerland but raised in Italy, where he now lives. And now please let me briefly say how the discussion is going to be structured before I introduce the participants. We will talk in English, but of course everybody is free to switch to German, Bulgarian, or even Italian, as a matter of fact, to better express a point if we can then jointly translate it. I will first introduce Bettina, Stanimir, and Fabien, and then we will have a very first round of one question to each of you to introduce your different points of view and backgrounds. And then we are going to have a second round of statements of roughly 10 minutes each, first by Fabien, more generally on Pasolini and his relevance today, then Stanimir on Pasolini's reception in the Bulgarian context and a critical positioning of his approach, and then Bettina with regard to the concept of the exhibition in Plovdiv and curatorial perspectives on politically informed art in a wider sense. And then afterwards, we will enter discussion with some questions and open the panel for questions from the audience later on. And we are planning with roughly one and a half hours of time. Please let me briefly introduce Bettina Steinbrügge, Stanimir Panayotov, and Fabien Vitali. Bettina is the director of the Kunstverein in Hamburg, which is the main center for contemporary art in Hamburg. It is worth mentioning that the Kunstverein in Hamburg is also historically the first exhibition venue for art at all in the city of Hamburg and it is over 200 years old. And then in this 200 year history, Bettina is the first woman to be its director. She's also a professor of art theory and curatorial practice at the Hamburg Academy of Fine Arts and has published many books and monographies on topics of contemporary art and artists. A focus point of her work as a curator has a lot to do with the present exhibition in Plovdiv since she has worked a lot at the intersection of art and film. After studies at the Art Institute of Chicago and Paris, she studied art history, English, and comparative literature in Kassel, where she worked for the Documentary and Video Festival. And since 2007, she has also been a curator of the Forum Expanded of the Berlinale Film Festival in Berlin. She was the director of the Halle für Kunst Contemporary Arts Center in Lüneburg from 2001 to 2007. And since 2010, she was a curator for contemporary art at the Belvedere in Vienna, where she developed the Belvedere 21, the main venue for contemporary Austrian and international art, film, and music. And she also worked as a curator at the Kunsthalle in Mulhouse and the French Alsace before becoming director of the Kunstverein in Hamburg in 2014. Stanimir is a philosopher with, if I dare say, a profile that is rather unique in contemporary academia. 
since he specializes in critical thinking at the crossroads of philosophy and comparative gender studies, but with a specialization in medieval studies, as well as feminist philosophy. He holds a BA in philosophy from Sofia University and an MA in philosophy and gender studies from the Euro Balkan Institute in Skopje, North Macedonia. And he did his PhD in comparative gender studies from the Euro Balkan Institute in Skopje, North Mac uh, at the, excuse me, he did his PhD in comparative gender studies at the Central European University in Budapest under the title, The Problem of Disembodiment an Approach from Continental Feminist Realist Philosophy. Stanimir has carried out research and held fellowships at the Institute of the Slovenian Academy of Science and Arts in Ljubljana, at the Institute of Social Sciences and Humanities in Skopje, at Linköping University in Sweden, and the American Research Center in Sofia, as well recently at the Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy of Kingston University in London and Utrecht University. He has been teaching frequently at various international institutions, among them the Euro Balkan Institute in North Macedonia, at Central European University in Bud Budapest, and at the dual Palestinian American Al Quds Bart College for Arts and Science in Palestine. For the perspective of our discussion, it is important to mention that he is the co director and co organizer of Sophia Queer Forum since 2012, and he has organized summer schools on sexualities, cultures, and politics in Skopje and Belgrade between 2012 and 2017. He is also the editorial director of the journal Identities, Journal for Politics, Gender, and Culture, and he has translated many books and texts by critical thought on critical thought into Bulgarian by authors such as Judith Butler, Wendy Brown, David Halperin, and Mackenzie Walk. He has several books forthcoming right now. Among them, I mentioned Ozone, Object-Oriented Studies, coming in fall, I guess, and with Daniel Lukes, a book on black metal theory entitled Black Metal Rainbows, which is announced for next spring. Fabien Vitali, our third participant, is a researcher and Pasolini expert. He studied Italian and French philology in Basel, Geneva, and Pisa, and graduated in Basel. He then obtained his PhD at the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa with a huge study on Lampedusa's literature, on which he currently is preparing the forthcoming book, Un altro più lucido e luminoso mondo, La letteratura secondo Tommasi di Lampedusa, to be published with Edizioni ETS in Pisa this year. Also forthcoming is a volume on the conference on the 60th anniversary of Lampedusa's Il Gatto Pardo, held in Hamburg in 2018. From 2010 to 11, Fabien was a research assistant at Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, and from 2011 to 2016 at Hamburg University. And since 2016, he teaches at the University of Kiel, where he's pursuing his habilitation, the postdoctoral lecture treatise, with a study on the paradox in the context of Venetian humanism, for which last year he was a fellow at the Centro Tedesco degli Studi Veneziani in Venice, where he now continues to live and work, and from where he speaks today. But above all, Fabien is also a participant in this present exhibition that is to open tomorrow after Pasolini in Plovdiv as one of the authors of a huge work that is exhibited there called Allegories of Power, a scenic reflection on Pier Paolo Pasolini's Salo or the 120 Days of Sodom, which he did together with Gabriella Agneledu in Karlheinz Delvo, um, a work which premiered in German language at the Deutsche Schauspielhaus Theater in Hamburg in 2015 and was subsequently performed in Vienna in 2017 and in French at the International Theatre Festival of saint vit in Belgium in 2018. And for this exhibition in Plovdiv, the text meant to be spoken and performed by two actors was translated into English and recorded. In this work, Allegories of Power, they asked what importance does Pasolini's critique of capitalist mechanisms take today and investigate the relevance of Pasolini's film Salo and its political significance in contemporary society. Salo takes, as many of you may know, the Marquis de Sade's brutal settings of sexual violence and torture to Mussolini's fascist Republic of Salo, where four powerful corrupt male libertines retreat to a mansion, kidnapping young women and men, holding them captive to gradually subject them to increasingly violent sexual abuse, rape, and torture. Pasolini used this to represent an allegory of contemporary consumer society's fascism. The reflection with still photographs by Deborah Baer, who was an English photographer who pursued photography for cinema in Italy and collaborated with numerous leading film directors, among them Pasolini, who invited her as the only official photographer on the sets of his last film, make Allegories of Power, a very powerful work that juxtaposes the comment with the images, the photos. 
Deborah Bär was married to the German Jewish film journalist and director Gideon Bachmann, who unfortunately died in 2016, who conducted numerous conversations with Pasolini between 1963 and 1975. And Fabien is currently translating and critically editing Pasolini's important conversations with Gideon Bachmann in German. And the book will hopefully be published soon too. Mm -hmm. Um, before I start the, quest, the first question, I just uh, want to uh, put one word to myself. My name is Benjamin Femmen, as said, and I'm the co-curator of the exhibition in Plovdiv, which Bettina and I developed together. I'm the coordinator of the Warburg House in Hamburg. I'm an art historian with a background in media and communication studies, having studied in Hamburg and Rome and done a PhD on contemporary art politics and theory in Paris and Hamburg. I work here in, at the Warburg House, where I'm sitting right now, as a scientific coordinator for research programs and cultural program and a curator. The Warburg House is the building that the art historian Abi Warburg, who is best known for his famous image atlas, built in the 1920s for his library, which used to be here in this room, with his famous elliptical reading room in which I'm sitting right now. Um, it was, I mean, we're sitting here right now very much alone, unfortunately due to Corona. The original library was brought to London in 1933 to save it from the Nazis, where it is today as the Warburg Institute, the Warburg Institute in English. And the Warburg House today houses different research centers on political iconography, contemporary image culture, and the history of art politics, which is a background to my personal interest in the topics we will discuss right now. To begin our first round, to introduce each one of you, Please let me ask you each a short question about your perspective and your respective points of view. Stanimir, I would like to start with you. Can you tell us a bit about your background as a philosopher at the crossroads of philosophy and gender studies with a specialization in medieval and antique philosophy and your point of contact with Pasolini against this background? Um, hi, everybody. Thanks, Benjamin. Um, I guess... Uh, um, there's not that much to say regarding the intersection of um, gender and to be more precise, um, early medieval slash late antique philosophy, um, because this is one of the areas I specialize in. I specialize in. Uh, one significant thing I could say that I think is relevant to the discussion today is that I developed a late interest in, in late antiquity. I I was I was trained uh, um, as a philosopher, but I but I've always been at the fringes of philosophy uh, and cultural studies um, as well as gender studies, which is something I educated myself in uh, practically up until my uh, my master's degree. Um, and so. My own, um, I, I experienced a particular turn to to antiquity and late antiquity uh, in the beginning of my PhD studies, but that's that's not how how this intersects with Pasolini, um, with with Pasolini in particular, which I thought was the second part of your question. Um, my introduction to Pasolini was much more personal, I would say. Um, uh, the way I stumbled upon uh, him is in is twofold. First of all, this was through music. Um, I was obsessed. Um, I would say this is the soundtrack of my life by the British industrial band Coil, um, who have a famous song from an early album from '84, I think, which is called "Ostia: The Death of Pasolini." Um, and to be honest, I, I I did know of Pasolini, but I wasn't particularly fond of uh, his work uh, up until the early 2000s, I would say. Um, uh, and so it was through music that I developed this interest. Uh, Coil was also a particularly um, queer band as well. Um, so uh, this is how I ended up developing an interest uh, through music to then to then discover things that that made sense in, on, a, on a biographical level. I wouldn't go uh, really into the details of that, but but I uh, but I think it's also important for me as a queer man to say that I also identify with 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 him as a sexual being as well as a political being. Um, I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm a outspokenly left wing intellectual in Bulgaria and international context and as well as um, I do a career in, in queer uh, queer studies as well. Great, thank you very much. Fabien, uh, let me go on with a question to you. Can you tell us about your work, uh, especially as a translator and editor 
of uh, the two books that I'm going to hold in the camera, among others. The one is titled in German, Fabian Kunst Vitali zu Pierpaolo Pasolini, Vom Verschwinden der Glühwürmchen, which translates as Fabian Kunst Vitali on Pierpaolo Pasolini's The Disappearance of the Fireflies, probably one of the most famous essays uh, by uh, Pasolini. This little book um, trans unites texts that you have, among others, translated. Um, it assembles the four, perhaps the four core texts that Pasolini wrote in his last year, 1975. And um, you also translated into German from Italian this book uh, by Giorgio Galli, Pasolini, der dissidente Kommunist, zur politischen Aktualität von Pierpaolo Pasolini. Pasolini, the dissident communist on the political relevance of Pierpaolo Pasolini today. Um, can you tell us about uh, a bit about this and, and your work on Pasolini in general? Uh, first of all, thank you very much <clears throat> to you, Benjamin, for your presentations and all the organization. And this, <clears throat> I want to extend this, uh, this thank you also to Stefka, which is hidden right now. Uh, I really appreciate to, to, to have the opportunity to participate to this conversation about art, politics and Pasolini. Um, I also want to say hello to everybody who is uh, listening now and afterwards. Uh, it, it feels very strange to me to talk um, from this virtual distance. Um, I, I'm very old school, so, so it's, it's kind of strange for me to, to talk uh, to you. Um, I, I would have been very glad to be in Bulgaria besides, but, because it's a, it's a country I don't know yet. And I, I really I hope that I will get the opportunity to, to come to, to Bulgaria sometimes. Um, then I must um, apologize for my English. Um, it might be obvious nowadays that one uh, speaks fluently English in order to get communication with a, a global intellectual community. Unfortunately, this is not my case. So if I do not succeed in making myself clear, just just interrupt me. Um, as uh, Benjamin said, I'm, I'm talking to you right now from Venice, where I live and where I do my research um, about Renaissance literature, which is a topic that is quite far away from, from what we're talking about now today. Um, however, I think that maybe I just have to say that Venice, I think it's, it's, a, it's quite an interesting place um, to look at our issues since it's one of the most famous or important location where art is actually challenged uh, to express its political potential without thereby getting caught up in um, the, the ties of uh, commercialization. And I just wanted to point out this, this, uh, this problem because um, you talked about this topic also, uh, Benjamin. And as you uh, asked me about it, my intellectual relationship to Pasolini, I should say that maybe it's a, it's a little bit part of my uh, education since I was a child, since I grew up in an Italianized context with some um, Marxist um, sympathies. I, I don't know how this might sound in, in Bulgaria, which was a former communist uh, country. Um, so. I have uh, like a childhood relationship uh, to, to Pasolini. Um, but my very confrontation to answer your question, Benjamin, with Pasolini as a political poet and a political film director goes back to um, 2014 to 2015, um, when a German publishing house, Laika, um, asked me to translate and to introduce, and you already talked about it, the study of a well-known um, Italian historian, which is Giorgio Galli. And this study is entitled Pasolini Comunista Dissidente, uh, Pasolini Dissident Communist. And this was um, a, a rather strange experience for me because Galli, in fact, aimed to trace and rebuild political thought of Pasolini, assuming that um, his political expression implies systematical political knowledge. In other words, he treated Pasolini as if he was a politician or like a sociological philosopher in the way we nowadays might consider the, the authors of, um, of the Frankfurter Schule, Adorno, Horkheimer, and so on. Um, now, that was something I would not agree about with Galli. And in fact, in its study, Galli highlights the political moments of, of Pasolini's writing, but then he shows that he has got no interest in, no interest at all, and no sensibility at all 
for, uh, I should say, the aesthetical dimension of Pasolini's work, which is rather strange, I think. And, and so for me, it was a blessing to work on, on Galli and to meet him also personally, because this experience brought me to think that it might be interesting to write my own essay uh, on the question of the political relevance of Pasolini, but from a totally different point of view, I, I might say um, a more philological rhetorical point of view, which assumes that the most um, important aspects uh, of politics in Pasolini is maybe an aesthetical one. And so um, just to finish, uh, to answer your question in, in 2050, I uh, decided to make my own essay <laughs> in German language in the context of a small anthology of Pasolini essays. I don't know if it's the core essays, if you, as, as, as you said, but maybe um, some, some of the most important essays from the late uh, period of his life. And I tried to discuss the radical political power of Pasolini as a poet. And maybe uh, afterwards we have the occasion to talk a little bit about this. Yes, we, we will definitely have the occasion to go further into this. Um, Bettina, to, to introduce yourself as a curator, how have you come in touch earlier with Pasolini, independently from the present exhibition context? I know that you also participated in one of, uh, in, in the film by Lili Renaudeva, one of the works that will be shown in this exhibition, titled Rome, 1st and 2nd November 1975, which was shot in Rome in 2019, I think. Yes, at the Villa Medici, actually, this film by Lili Renaud de Var. It's, um, uh, it's called Rome, 1st and 2nd November 1975, so the last 24 hours of his life. And um, Lili reenacted uh, the 24 hours. So um, uh, she invited 20 people from the art world, mainly from the art world, to um, play Pasolini. And me too, because she also invited me, we worked together before, but she also knew of my film background. I'm working in film for a long time now. I'm actually, when it comes to film history, self-taught. So it's I also at a certain, when I first watched Pasolini, I watched it um, uh, because of aesthetic reasons um, to learn more um, about filmmaking during these times. And um, it struck me and then later on, um, it was combined uh, with my political views and also my political interests. I'm also somehow trained in sociology and um, I, um, I'm really interested in the, what, what happens, what we understand from the past and how what we can learn from the past in order to understand our todays. And I was very much informed by this book by Emmanuel Wallerstein, um, first the essay, The End of the World as We Know It from um, 97. Uh, after that, he published the book Utopistics, or it's 96, I don't remember anymore. And it's about how our society changes and we are still in this process. And for me, I'm going back to all these figures in order to understand where we are and in order to understand how we can think outside um, the recent norms. And this also comes together with, with um, Pasolini. It was interesting when Lili invited me, I um, was just like, okay, why not? So um, I had to learn um, his last interviews Furio Co with Furio Colombo. And then there is the restaurant scene uh, with Pelosi and then the scene uh, when Pasolini is attacked. And so we have 20 people also like Dietrich Dietrichsen, uh, the young artist Verena Dengler from Vienna, mm. and we all play Pasolini. And we all act together with Pelosi, somebody, some younger people are playing Pelosi. Um, they are not such figures <laughs> of the art field. Um, and uh, so it, it was interesting because we are all um, we are all not actors and actresses. Uh, we were all um, we all tried to learn the text and to act out and to uh, feel um, Pasolini in a way. We are all very different. The film is quite long. We show all the four chapters um, there. Um, 
you have the tender Pasolini when he is with Pelosi. You have the more analytical Pasolini. Ivan Dietrich Dietrichsen is more analytical than I am when he acts Pasolini. And so you are going back and forth and you get an understanding um, about the differences between Pasolini and the time today. We have contemporary times. Uh, you understand, you can see the struggle of understanding or trying to impersonate Pas Pasolini in a certain way, which is um, a struggle in content. So how do we deal with Pasolini nowadays? Mm -hmm. So we tried to impersonate, we all try to impersonate Pasolini differently in a way. Mm -hmm. And um, so beforehand, uh, we also had to do interviews she will also edit the interviews. We don't see them in um, uh, in Plovdiv. I haven't seen the interviews myself. It will be part of a huge book project uh, where we talk about ourselves and our situation in society, our political views, our private personal views. This is also Pasolini. And so it's, um, it's a project that really brought me back to the political Pasolini in a way and also to the importance of Pasolini. And um, when Emil um, invited us um, to do something in Plovdiv, I mean, we had discussions and thought about Pasolini and it was, there are many, um, um, there are many also former ways of why using Pasolini in this way. I mean, his political views, his views on gender, um, the old Turkish bath as a venue, which is a very specific space. Um, then his 40, the 45th anniversary of his death in, in 2020. And so it all made sense to move on with Pasolini. And for me personally, it's like we are living in times that are highly charged at the moment, chaotic, political in a way, very aggressive. That came through Corona also in a way. Uh, we have all this in, in Germany, you see, we have all the rallies that are completely weird. Um, and um, going back to Pasolini and his ways of looking at society is such a, um, an interesting starting point um, to think about what's going on today. Yes, absolutely. Perhaps um, um, since I, I, I want to uh, invite you uh, in the next um, step to, to perhaps develop each of you, your, your thoughts on Pasolini a bit further, uh, one point in common that um, your comment, uh, what you just said, Bettina, joins um, Pasolini's work and the importance that uh, Fabian will be perhaps considering in his statement is precisely that Lili Renodeva and this project works with laypersons something that also Pasolini did in a lot of his films, of course, um, which uh, touches upon the aesthetic, but also the political concepts um, that make up uh, two, two levels, two aspects um, that the, the two sides of, of his work in general. Fabien, um, would you like to, to share some more thoughts um, with us um, on the relation of the poetical artistic uh, in Pasolini, uh, your personal views on, on his work? I will try because since you um, introduced me as a specialist or an expert, I'm quite embarrassed because I, th I, I think there is no such thing as Pasolini experts. I, I hate this, but I just I just uh, love to work with uh, to read it and to to look at these films. And I was um, quite interested about what said what uh, uh, Bettina said before because she was um, often. I mean, like the term, the political point of view, the political views and the political statement of Pasolini occurred very much in your, in your uh, short presentation. And what I want to do in the next, um, maybe in the next five minutes, if, it, if it's possible, is to ask the question, what, what is the political thought of, of Pasolini? Because maybe there is not, not no such thing as a consensus about what is a political thought of Pasolini. And I have no solution, uh, obviously, but just try to, to propose something. And if it's possible, uh, Benjamin, would you give me this small um, picture that I sent to you? Because I want to share this, this experience, this small empirical experience with you. Um, 
it's it's um, um, yeah maybe you have to bring it a little bit in the so. can enlarge it can you see it it's, it's a little bit small actually but anyway it's um, I took this photograph um, in Palermo uh, like three years ago with my my girlfriend when I was um, in the beautiful Quartiere della Calza which is um, a, a quartiere, uh, uh, like a place in the, the seaside of Palermo, which was also the place where lived uh, Giuseppe Tomasi di Lampedusa, um, the, the author of the great novel Il Gatto Pado, but that's a totally different story. I will not go into this. Um, I, I want to, to show you this, this um, writing on the wall because it's a quotation of one of Pasolini's late essays, now published in the Lettere Luterane, Lutheran Letters, that is a book of critical essays that with the Scritti Corsari, uh, Corsair writings, form some one of the most important expression of Pasolini's political positions of the 70s. And the writing says, be happy, they will teach you not to shine, but you ought to shine. Now, um, I really liked this, um, this, um, this graffiti. Actually, it's as a matter of fact, this, this quotation is totally decontextualized. And furthermore, it's, it's not correct. It's like a collage of, uh, or a rewriting of, of some notions that occur in the original context. But I do not say this in order to laugh about it or to minimize it. I, I just think it's, uh, on the contrary, it seems to me like a perfect example um, of the reception, or one kind of possible reception, a popular reception of Pasolini's political thought. And um, I even would go further. I don't know if it's true, but I might imagine that Pasolini himself would have been very glad um, to see his own words decontextualized and reduced to this sim simple and naive slogan and put on a wall in Palermo, far away from the technocratic uh, hotspots of Western Europe and far away also from the totally negative interpretation that most of his political thoughts received in other more intellectual contexts. So this is uh, a very interesting um, example of positive uh, reception of Pierpaolo Pasolini. And this is one of the possible reception uh, options that, that exist in my point of view. And this makes me also remind um, what Pasolini himself once wrote in a journalistic essay uh, in the 70s, in the mid 70s, la rivoluzione sarà fatta da giovani felici e che ballano. So, somehow like this, it's like um, the revolution will be made of young, happy people dancing in the streets. And I dedicate this to the, to the young people right now um, in, in Sofia protesting uh, in the streets. I think this is, um, um, there is some interesting tie between this kind of reception, this popular positive reception and a real existing positive point of view um, that, uh, that Pasolini had. Um, even uh, if we um, tend to associate him to pessimistic points of views. However, what I wanted to suggest by this small example is the impact of Pasolini's work and mostly of his journalistic writings on people's fantasy. And so I think that what you, Benjamin and uh, Bettina, what you do in Ploftiv um, to propose a project to question the reception of Pasolini in contemporary art is a very fascinating way to interrogate the force of uh, the social political message of Pierpaolo Pasolini. I think it's perfect. Now, what might be interesting to do, as I already anticipated, is what I try to do now is to um, ask why does Pasolini continue to stimulate in a fresh way our minds and our political debates. What kind of political message are we talking about? So what is the political dimension of Pasolini? Um, I first must say it is of course totally um, impossible to um, explore this topic in all its comple complexity. Um, I therefore will not insist on the very di diversified background of Pasolini's political identity, its ties to the Catholicism, and to Marxism or to Antonio Gramsci and so on. 
I just want to focus on what the vulgata, the, the majority today in Italy and in Western Union, Europe, mainly remember as the political position of, of Pierpaolo Pasolini, his state of mind. And I think that this position legitimate, legitimately um, can be considered um, expressed, found its most powerful and consistent expression in his journalistic work in the last three years before his death, death in, in 1775. And as I already said, it is collected in two books entitled The Lutheran Letters, published after uh, Pasolini's death and the Scripti Gorsari, the Corsair writings who were uh, published um, um, in 1775. These, the articles these, these two books contain have been published in the most important Italian journal, a very bourgeois and a rather right-winged journal named Corriere della Sera. That means um, two things. Pasolini reached a large audience and the second thing is this audience was mostly hostile towards him as a poet, as a Marxist, and as a homosexual, and so on. And so Pasolini's political action as a writer implies a strongly dialectical background. He in fact writes to challenge a conservative bourgeois establishment and their intellectual and moral hypocrisy. To put it simple, Pasolini's pol political thought, and I think you can now just we can get rid of the, the image I, I wanted to, to show you um, at the beginning. Thank you very much, um, Benjamin. Um, to put it simple, Pasolini's political thought can be reduced um, to um, the notion of anthropological revolution. And maybe we can illustrate this, uh, this notion um, by the example, following the example of one of the most famous articles um, that Benjamin already cited. It's entitled L'Articolo delle Lucciole, the Articles of Fireflies. And I want you to notice that the use of the term firefly is um, obviously a metaphorical use. And this is very interesting. I, I want to come back to this um, in, in a few seconds. Um, I would like to try to resume the main points of this article because maybe it gives us some, something like um, uh, a starting point to, to discuss political thought of, of Pasolini. Um, Pasolini points out that in the 60s and in the 70s, the ruling class is a traditional bourgeois and ca Catholic one. Now, this ruling class made something like um, a terrible error um, he, she, she, she made a political compromise with the culture of progress, but not a, progr a progress in positive sense, not a progress um, of civil rights, but a progress in order to establish a new world order based on the industry of unnecessary objects, forcing thereby people in Italy, mostly in Italy, but uh, probably in the whole world, to become stupid consumers of stupid, useless things. So that means the ruling class, this is the point of view of Pasolini, made a sort of a pact with the devil. They accepted the evolution of society from archaic traditional forms of human being to a new model, which implies alienation from humanistic traditions. And I quote Pasolini, he says, we are no longer and everyone else knows, facing new times, but rather a new era of human history, of that human history whose phases are millenarian. So this is what the anthropological revolution uh, is about. Now, what I think is very interesting it, is that Pasolini translates this um, abstract political con content in the firefly metaphor. The ancient times were the times of the fireflies, whereas the new time will be the time after the extinction of the firefly. The firefly therefore becomes a naive but very efficient, I think, metaphor that associates or even lights up the, uh, the idea of a past world based on positive human experiences, whereas the extinction of the fireflies is equivalent to the extinction of this past world on behalf of a new world order, which is totally alienated and sad. 
And as you see, Pasolini tends to illustrate abstract political contact, content in this article, but also in other, in other articles with metaphors. In this case, the firefly metaphors. And this gives it like a second dimension. Yeah? Um, in this case, it's like a familiar dimension or quasi a fairy tale dimension. In reality, it might be a quotation also from Dante's Inferno, but I will not, I will not go into this in this, in this uh, person, in this um, uh, very moment. As a matter of fact, um, it's, it's a very efficient way of, of working because as we can see um, um, following the example of the Firefly articles, several writers and philosophers from Leonardo Sciascia, an Italian uh, poet and writer, uh, um, up to Georges Didier Huberman, will pick up exactly this image of the Firefly to discuss Pasolini's position and to um, think, think further, base, basing uh, themselves on, on the position of Pasolini. So until today, most of the people um, dealing with the, the notion of um, um, anthropolo anthropological revolution remind exactly the uh, metaphorical term of the Firefly. So this is very, very efficient, as I said. Now, I would like to conclude this, this uh, reflections by some consideration about, about Pasolini's idea of, of this uh, anthropological revolution, about its efficiency and about its meaning for us today. And it's uh, a topic that uh, uh, interests also Bettina, if, I, if, I, if, I, um, if I'm not wrong. Now, many persons on one hand side um, have treated Pasolini as an enemy of social progress, wishing history to stop and dreaming of a world in terms of a mythical state of innocence. Yes, um, uh, I think, um, Stanley, you, uh, you were talking about, um, I think, um, about, I just noticed something that really was interesting. I uh, just, I just lost it. I just lost it, sorry, but still. Some, pre some people um, treated Pasolini as um, a conservative enemy of, um, of, um, of progress, some kind of um, a Rousseau, a modern Rousseau, uh, or uh, Giacomo Leopardi, an Italian poet in the, the 19, 19th century, was against um, techn technological progress and so on. Other persons, on contrary, treated Pasolini as a prophet, yeah, able to see what will be, that means, the actual society that claims to be, but actually does not base on values such as democracy, freedom, and equality. A society that assumes the idea of progress, not in humanistic sense, but in a technocratic sense, heading towards the total control of citizens. A society that claims multiplicity, whereas in reality, it accepts to follow one single vision, a poor vision, of human being that is a stupid hedonistic vision of human being. Pasolini would say a petit bourgeois vision of human being. Now, I may agree with the latter um, uh, interpretation. Uh, that means uh, Pasolini was, was very clear in, in seeing what will happen in, uh, in 20, in 30 years. Um, but what really uh, interests me to point out is that Pasolini is either a Rousseau style conservative, nor a prophet. What makes really his fascination, I think, is the original and very dry, dramatic and powerful combination of rationality and poetry. So I would maybe quote once again from the Firefly article in order to conclude then. Pasolini says, because I'm a writer and I do write to create polemics or at least to discuss with other writers, allow me to give a poetical literary characterization of that phenomenon that I call the anthropological revolution. This would serve to simplify and abbreviate our discourse and probably to understand it better. Now, what does he mean with understand it better? Um, I would comment Pasolini on the one side is an intellectual following the engagement concept of Jean-Paul Sartre, this is clear. He uses his brain to observe and to criticize in an empirical way. But on the other side, Pasolini never translates this empirical results into a political or philosophical system. 
the red translates it into poetical figures in uh, metaphors as the, the firefly uh, example, or as he did in the last period of his work in allegorical visions like Teorema uh, or Salon. And once again, speaking about Pasolini, it's not possible to distinguish one dimension from the other, the critical rationalistic dimension, the Sartre dimension, from the poetical figurative dimension. It is a dynamic balance where one dimension depends on the other. Um, hence, I guess what makes the appeal, and on this I want to, I want to conclude this, this, this short statement, what makes the appeal of Pasolini's political thought is precisely its dynamic form, that is, the metaphorical issue of his critical intelligence. Or maybe we could say, following Plato, um, it's, it's force as poesis. Yeah? Pasolini is like projecting linguistically something into the dark. He, he tries to read, to, to put light into a dark. He tries to make attempts to image and write what cannot be seen or not yet. So I think that makes Pasolini's work strongly ambivalent and fascinating. It gives it an open structure. And we might resume maybe that the most vital um, political message of Pasolini is not a pure thematic, thematical one. It's not, uh, the, it's not only the abstract idea of, uh, of uh, anthropological revolution, which is an idea who has been developed already by Adorno, Horkheimer and Marcuse, but it is also, and maybe mostly, a formal one, consisting in, I would say, the radical form, force of ambivalence. This formal solution allows us all, I think, um, to participate to Pasolini's thought and to continue to discuss it and to continue to further write it. I don't know how to translate it, you know, like, we, we continue to write Pasolini's works. And I think, and, and this is, um, but I really would like to thank also Bettina and, and Benjamin. I think that this is what really is demonstrated also um, by the works that you um, gathered together in the Plot Exposition. And this is why I, I really look forward to, to have some new inputs and see how people interpret and will interpret these open structures from Pasolini and the profoundly ambivalent um, figures that he um, that he uh, that he translated us. I, I will now um, um, cut off the microphone because otherwise you will just hear the Basilica dei Frari. <laughs> the, the tossing bells give us a sign <laughs> to to um, perhaps give the word to Stani too. Thank you very much for this very insightful reflection, Fabien. Um, uh, you, you mentioned the, the politically critical Pasolini, the journalist Pasolini too. It is, I think, outside Italy until today, it might even be uh, not enough known how engaged Pasolini was, especially in the 1970s and the middle of, and even towards the end of his life at the middle of the 1970s as a very investigated, engaged author with weekly columns in, in newspapers in Italy. And on the other hand, you, you cite George Didi Übermann's um, book on, on Pasolini and the Fireflies, um, who I think stands um, for another context of you coming from, from, a, uh, from, from, from a rather French uh, background um, tackling Pasolini. Um, I think what you point us towards already in your reflections uh, are the different contexts, the different cultural contexts of the reception of Pasolini and his works. Um, which provides me with the opportunity to, to uh, give the word to Stanimir, um, who might uh, want to share some thoughts with us on the reception of, of Pasolini in, in the Bulgarian context, um, perhaps even how Pasolini actually was perceived during the Cold War, and if there has been an ongoing transition in his reception, if there has been such a reception, and the transition from the pre-Stalinist, from the Stalinist to the post-Stalinist um, society. Um, and I also saw you um, um, noting Fabien's reference to Plato. Uh, I think that you might even <laughs> want, uh, I was curious uh, what you would be thinking about uh, positioning Pasolini in this pre-modern context. I guess you have your own views on that. Stanimir, please uh, have the word. 
I will go back to probably Plato at the end of my, my expose. Um, so as we agreed, um, I will speak in 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 two ways. Um, I'll I'll give a rather um, technical overview of what I consider to be a Bulgarian reception. Maybe reception is an overstatement. Um, and then I will speak a little bit about um, the way Pasolini's work and political visions relate to, um, to, to historical pasts. So on the first part, um, as a way of introduction, I would say a couple of things to situate the material, the raw material of that Bulgarian alleged reception. Um, so first of all, Pasolini was wrong about one very, very major thing when it, come, when it came to state socialism and the ideals of uh, um, um, communism or what in the socialist bloc in particular, uh, the state uh, um, socialist bloc uh, that are uh, satellite states of uh, USSR, in particular, was known um, as uh, the never arriving uh, communist utopia. Uh, so Berzolini was wrong on the on the question of consumption. Uh, I wanna. This is my prefatory note. Uh, even after Khrushchev's thought, um and uh, the, the massive popularization of uh, uh, information of what what was the horror of Stalinist USSR, um, even in the context of this and the um, um, arrival of the new left in the 60s and the Western world of, of which uh, uh, Pasolini was uh, somehow um, um, connected, um, all of his interviews and political writings that I've seen uh, take uh, extremely naively the question of consumerism. Um, I, I do, however, think that um, there, is, there is a certain confluence between naivete and honesty. So I, I, I think he's honest when it comes to his critique of consumerist societies. Uh, his, right, his heart is in the right place, but uh, with respect to socialist politics and state socialism, uh, he doesn't understand that it is exactly the um, antagon an antagonism with consumerism that crumbled state socialism. This is what this is what destroyed state socialism in its core, and this is true for both uh, Yugoslav socialism um, and um, much more so to USSR uh, Soviet uh, uh, countries such as Bulgaria. Um, so on this, I fundamentally disagree with. Uh, uh, with the idea that Pasolini's critique of consumerism can be of any use to, to the Eastern European context more broadly construed. So the reason I'm, I'm, I'm starting with this is that um, Pasolini has been published in the cracks of Bulgarian publishing before 1999, um, rather uh, periodically. So um, there are two reasons why he managed to go through the cracks of uh, uh, socialist censorship in Bulgarian publishing. One is uh, his virulent critique of uh, uh, capitalist economies and his critique of what he considers to be alienation and consumerism. And the other is his uh, um, caustic remarks on the nature of the Western European uh, small bourgeoisie. Now, this the second aspect was particularly, I think, sexy for for the Bulgarians, um, and um, um, uh, but the Bulgarian apparatchiks, not the Bulgarian readers of Pasolini, because uh, the people who intellectually perhaps wanted to to publish his work were uh, just looking for a way to smuggle him in. Um, and uh, overall, I think these two motives for his uh, scant reception in Bulgarian publishing until the crumbling of communism um, can be summarized under, under uh, the larger umbrella term of uh, critique of alienation. Um, and, and that's, again, I wanna emphasize that, that's, that, that's exclusively um, useful. There are a couple of other intellectuals that, that did have a similar probably to Pasolini's reception. Um, so, a, so a rather scant, but nonetheless uh, present um, uh, work. Uh, one of them uh, is Oriana Falacci who unlike Pasolini 
um, is uh, got some traction and popularity in the mid 2000s because of her uh, right wing invective after 9/11. Um, so, so she she, refer, she 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 differs from him in that way that she found the popularity, and I hope Pasolini will find the popularity uh, now with your exhibition uh, in Bulgaria and Plovdiv, uh, because I don't I don't I don't think he he, he does have any public leanings um, and popularity in Bulgaria uh, nowadays. Now. Um, um, I don't have much to say about the reception after 1999. Uh, what I can say is uh, I prepared, and uh, Stefka will post about this in the Facebook event, I think. I prepared a bibliography uh, that's very short. It's only two pages. I, I hope it is as comprehensive as it's possible of all the writings of Pasolini that were translated in Bulgaria. Uh, there is, uh, there's one thing missing. Uh, happily today I was informed by Bulgarian poet uh, Marian Bodakov that there is a unique interview by uh, Vera Gancheva, who's a very famous Bulgarian translator and intellectual. She did an interview with, uh, with, with Pasolini, so there is a Bulgarian interview there. I was informed about this today, uh, happily. So that will come up on the bibliography a bit late. But what I can say about uh, uh, the period after 1989, uh, about Pasolini, is, uh, he did uh, he did have, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, some some publicity in terms of publishing. Uh, the bibliography reveals as much. So most of the bibliography is uh, placed after 1989. Uh, however, it's really really very scant and um, um, and and it's mostly uh, dispersed throughout journals. So there are two books of Pasolini that are published in English. And I would like to ask Stefka just to show, show us these two, uh, two books. This is the first book by Pasolini published in Bulgarian in, um, uh, uh, by the publishing house Narodna Kultura in 79. It's published in 79. Uh, this is A Violent Life. Uh, it's an excellent translation. Um, and the second one is from 2006. Um, I don't know if Stefka is able to show the second cover, but if not, I can also I can also show it. It's an extremely beautiful. Uh, it's a really very beautiful edition of Pasolini's poetry. It's a selection, and it's uh, and it's made. Uh, the translation is by Luban Lubanov. Um, uh, very very elegant elegant language. Extremely careful, I would say. Um, and it's also a really, really very beautiful edition. Um, so these are the two books uh, that are out there. Teorema is also published in Bulgarian. However, it's published as a novel in a, in a, in a literary journal. Um, it was translated by Julian Stambouliev. Um, so there are three, three, three books altogether. Everything else is scattered throughout, uh, throughout journals. Um, one um, thing I, would, I forgot to point out regarding uh, this research and bibliography I did, I, uh, I, don't, I can't take entirely credit for it. There is a very nice uh, work, uh, short research done by Bulgarian researcher Eva Manova. She, I, I based my bibliography on a bibliography that she, that, that she prepared. She, she does have an excellent article on the Bulgarian reception of Pasolini. Uh, it's the only one there is out there, but still we have one, but that's, that's good enough. Um, um, so naturally, as with everything else in Bulgarian uh, culture in late socialism, pretty much everything happened at the cusp of the transition. So late, the late 80s were a time of strange ambivalence. Um, the a credit should be given to Ivan Znapolsky, who introduced uh, uh, Pasolini as a filmmaker. Um, this is a snapshot of the bibliography step phase right now, um, um, showing it will be made available online. Uh, later, probably tomorrow. So this, uh, the essay uh, of Pasolini on the uh, cinema of poetry translated. So Znebolski uh, introduced this uh, this work in uh, in the late eighties. He also did write uh, an excellent piece, uh, a portrait of Pasolini as a filmmaker, not exclusively as a literary person. Um, I want to now sh just say briefly. Um, something about the, the reception itself, again, going back to socialist uh, Bulgaria. Um, there is a fine, really fine preface to uh, A Violent Life written by Svetozar Latarov. 
And I did uh, go back to this. I, I read the book long ago, but I did go back to the preface to the book uh, to kind of uh, capture the language of how how exactly it came about that Pasolini was published in '79. I mean, I, I want to give you a, just a little bit of context to how um, um, uh, paradoxical and uh, somewhat scandalous this is in '79. By the time this book is published. Um, Gramsci has one book published in Bulgaria in 56. And that's the one and only edition of, of Gramsci in Bulgaria. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg, another heterodox Marxist, according to then Bulgarian standards, um, has a book um, that's published in 64, I think. Uh, no, 1960. 1960, and uh, that's pretty much all there is to, um, to revolutionary Marxism in 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 Bulgaria in state, state Bulgarian um, socialism, um, and I'm, of course I mentioned these names because they're they're idolized for the Western left, and how how, how this and this is extremely important nowadays in, in our context. So in the preface of Zlatarov, the Pasolini is presented as a person of contradictions, which is fine. I don't think that anyone can object to that, even Pasolini himself. Um, um, and he outlines that he's relevant for Bulgaria because of his indelible corruption. Uh, his analysis of the indelible corruption of capitalism is a quote. So some other snippets um, are also quotes. Um, he speaks vaguely as a critique uh, to Pasolini, saying that nevertheless, he offers somewhat unclear dreams of um, what uh, the future society will be. Uh, he congratulates him for overcoming the overcoming of post-hermeticism in literature, um, while at the same time uh, congratulating him for being a realist writer, which in 79 is not a, not a very relevant piece of information, mm -hmm. given that in the 70s he's not a, he's not a realist. Regardless, this is how he's uh, being represented. Um, and of course, uh, then go, uh, comes the most interesting part in uh, Zlatarov's introduction to Pasolini, where he says, uh, where he speaks of sex and sexuality in, um, I would say, the most appropriate possible way given the context. So um, one of, I, I think it's a ridiculous uh, and funny statement, but it, but, but it says a lot. Um, one of the qualifications he gives there is that there's nothing in Pasolini's life that's extraordinary which is an extraordinary claim in and of itself. Um, this is the prefatory note to then discuss sex, uh, gender, and sexuality. And then he says, um, Pasolini is trying to give us a realistic picture of man's instincts um, and his pursuits in love. And then I quote, uh, of love, men, women, and any other kind of love. So uh, words like homosexuality, et cetera, don't appear. Um, and then curiously, he is Lotarov says, Pasolini studies how sex, that is to say the most intimate in the, in, in, in the human being becomes a commodity. And I think this is, this is the greatest part of the introduction where he nails uh, what is the most important both in the, in the novel and in the then context of uh, presenting uh, Pasolini. Uh, but there is one other aspect that he mentions. And then I'm gonna go to give you a bit more examples of reception. Well, there is one great example uh, of a um, uh, topic that he singles out from Pasolini's work. Um, and that's uh, the connection between the, 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 I'm not really sure that in English this is a term, but the term is declassing, so to declass a class, uh, to lose your class standing, that is. The connection between declassing and fascization. So I think this is a great line from Zlatarov's introduction because it does give us a key how we can use Pasolini's work in Eastern European context. I think there is a great deal of connection between what happened to uh, um, 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 people in terms of poverty and mass, what's called mass declassing in Bulgarian Lexis 
and how this has led to, to, to fascization tendencies in society. And I think in this, uh, we can return to him again and again right now. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to your exhibition and see how this is developed there. Um, so I think this is a contemporary point of meeting the before and after of Pasolini in Bulgaria. Um, and um, I would say there are, um, in Bulgarian literature, there's a couple of uh, poets only that have a head on understanding and um, engagement with Pasolini. One of them is unfortunately the, the young poet Nikola Atanasov who, who passed away last year. Um, and he has, he, he was extremely influenced by Pasolini. He was a friend of mine. Um, he, he will stay in Bulgarian literature with, with a book uh, uh, as a canon of Bulgarian poetry that's called Organic Forms. Um, and he has an earlier a poem that's called Nostalgia After Pasolini. And then um, there is a poem by a Bulgarian writer and scholar uh, Vladimir Saburin, which is called Hilderlin Pasolini and Mueller, uh, meaning Hanir Mueller. Um, these are the two poets I can single out. One interesting uh, note though, is that um, uh, the, um, th there is a Pasolini Bulgarian connection actually. Uh, other than the Vera Gantsova interview I mentioned, uh, one of uh, the musicians who did scores for Pasolini is an Argentinian born musician and composer. His name is Luis Enrique Bakalov. And he's of Bulgarian descent actually. He wrote the score for uh, uh, the gospel according to Matthew. Uh, this is I think the only score he wrote for him, but he was uh, Oscar nominated for that. And, uh, seven, in, in 67. Uh, Bakalov is not Bulgarian in and of himself, his grandparents were. Um, so there is a curious Bulgarian connection there. And one uh, probably last thing on this point I, wanna, I just want to briefly mention is that um, I think there is a certain analogy in Bulgarian cinema um, in terms of how cinema is done and in terms of what the message is. Um, I think this is the work of uh, Irina Aktasheva and Krista Piska. Uh, there are two Bulgarian directors that were greatly misunderstood before the transition. And are, I think still greatly misunderstood after the transition. Before they were seen as reactionary um, uh, critiques of communists. Now they're seen as, 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 as anti-communists, which is extremely false. Um, I understand that many of the viewers wouldn't know the context of that. I just uh, want to draw the, draw the analogy and um, incite interest in their work. And to some extent, without probably the deep interest in sexuality and gender, I think uh, the work of Bulgarian director Krasimir Kurumov is also very, uh, very relevant. And I would surmise to some extent influenced as well by Pasolini. It was a very well read, uh, writer, he wrote a huge volume, uh, The Poetics of Cinema. Um, and um, uh, he deals with, uh, with extreme poverty and neoliberalization uh, in contemporary Bulgaria, et cetera, et cetera, in, in ways that I think resemble uh, Pasolini as well. Now, given the time limitations, I'm not exactly sure I have time to go to the second part of my exposition. <laughs> So I, I, I don't know if I have the time to say anything, but um, I will just take, okay, I'll just take one minute. I'll, I'll not do the second part of the expose. I'll just give a snippet of what I wanted to give. Um, I think I'll make it more as a statement. I think one thing that's extremely interesting about Pasolini is his relation to, to antiquity and the historical past. I think uh, Fabian mentioned this uh, vividly that uh, he's often seen as a, somewhat conservative uh, intellectual and naive as well, I would add, because, because he did have uh, uh, this um, uh, sentimentality about the forlorn world of um, uh, idyll, uh, where um, contemporary uh, capitalism and consumerism weren't part of the game. To be honest, I think he's wrong about it too. But uh, um, the important uh, thing about this and this re his relation uh, about the historical past, I think uh, it, it, it can be seen most vividly in his movies, not in his writing, is uh, something that I, I would call queer traditionalism, 
he's a weird figure at the fringes of queerness and tradition. I think there's uh, not much other uh, cultural specimens to compare him to, but I would say that Jean Janet is one of those. Um, and the great Derek German. I think these are these are the people who, who can also be compared to, to what I try to call queer traditionalism. Um, and um, of course, what unites all of these uh, uh, authors uh, is uh, another uh, another aspect. That's their um, uh, sexual innuendos to criminal types and uh, dangerous sex. Um, um, so on that occasion, um, on that note, I will just end uh, my presentations. And I'm sorry if I've taken more time than I have to. It's, it's very unfortunate that we are limited in terms of time because I would have loved to hear you yeah. do more, especially on these last two points. Um, yeah. But uh, thank you very much, Sanimir, uh, especially for the insights on, on Pasolini in Bulgaria, which are, of course, very crucial. And if we have time at the end, I would love to hear more uh, during the question at the end, um, more about the poet friend of yours you mentioned, and, and if you have right. any projects of, of perhaps translating him into, into English. Right. Um, but um, uh, Stanimir just mentioned Derek Jarman. Um, the two of us had been hoping to include Derek Jarman in this exhibition. Um, uh, Derek Jarman, of course, is not only a filmmaker, he's, he resembles Pasolini very much in a lot of uh, uh, aspects, uh, because also he, Derek Jarman is not only a filmmaker, but also a wonderful writer, a poet. Um, uh, Pasolini was not that much interested in gardening and, and plants as Jarman was, um, but they share a, a great interest in nature, I think. Um, but I can say so much as that uh, Derek Jarman is present in the exhibition in Plovdiv because um, one work in the exhibition will be a film a work by Julian Cole um, from the 1980s uh, called Ostia in which Derek Jarman himself plays Pasolini. Um, so we're very glad that Julian Cole's work um, can assure a presence of uh, Derek Jarman in the exhibition. Um, and this leads me to the exhibition itself. Bettina, do you want to tell us a bit more about um, the exhibition, its, its concept, the background perhaps, and um, against this background, your, your perspective as a curator and also the perspective of, of a, an institution uh, of contemporary art, perhaps on the topicality and relevance of, of works of art that address Pasolini today? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I would like to start in a, in a general way. I mean, if, if one gets invited to curate something in a um, foreign country, in a certain atmosphere, in a certain space, uh, it's, it's always difficult um, to somehow decide on the topic when you are more political and uh, when you try to tackle something political. It's always quite, quite dangerous and um, when it comes to Pasolini, I was I was thinking about that a lot in the beginning, if it is possible or if somebody from the West is coming there and dragging Pasolini to Bulgaria and making an exhibition there and saying, okay, um, you know, look at this, this is cool or whatsoever. And this is um, always a danger, a danger of curating or being a curator. Uh, what I find um, interesting and why I think it works is, um, I have two points. One is that Pasolini is a very um, ambivalent character with many contradictions. And this leads me to my second point. Uh, what I also find interesting is um, that you don't um, put a proposal out there and say, okay, this is uh, what, what we can discuss now and that's why it is important. It is rather a moment of contradiction for me uh, where you can start a discussion. And this is also the reason Pasolini in, in Bulgaria, I mean, on an aesthetic level, I liked the idea of having something with Pasolini in this old Turkish bath. I somehow bring it together with him and I find it interesting to use this mythical space for me. It's kind of magic. I like this old bath and putting 
Pasolini in there, who also is not foreign to myth and, and other things. So it is a special, this is a special physical atmosphere while looking at an exhibition and looking at Pasolini, which is, can be also a physical, um, which can be also a physical experience um, of watching these films. And I'm interested in that. I'm interested when something on an emotional level is really touching the visitor as well, and he gets something out of it. Um, the second thing is um, Bulgaria itself. I mean, I found it interesting. There was um, a Marxist, a communist from Raza, um, a wealthy background um, coming to a country that overcame communism in a certain way and embraced consumer society and looks definitely different on these topics than the educated person from the West who likes to, um, who likes his or her salon Marxism in a way. Um, I'm, I'm, it's, uh, um, I'm, I'm a bit, maybe also a bit cynical here, but I think uh, we can talk about it this way. And, and so there are also two systems crashing in a way. And uh, for me, since we overcome the dichotomy, oh, sorry, and my English is today is really bad. It's a bit, I'm sorry for that. Um, because we overcame the two values overcame the Cold War, the two systems, and we had to decide for one system. I find it interesting that this is clashing right now in a way that uh, we have to find something new. We have to find something new. We have to look at the different system and, 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 and try to understand how we maybe can form um, a different future because what is going on now is somehow not working anymore. And I think we see it everywhere. Um, that was a question then, question of corruption, I think it's interesting. I mean, corruption in many countries in Bulgaria, but also I think very hidden in Germany is like a gentleman's agreement in a way, or it's still treated um, as a gentleman's agreement. Um, then homophobia is coming up more and more. I think um, that is uh, also in Bulgaria in a way, but you can inform me about this, Stanimir, in a way. Uh, but but also um, in all the other countries. I mean, gender is such a topic at the moment. And I think showing it with Pasolini and also the physicality uh, is interesting. And and then on a formal level, I mean, there are so many, you know, if, if you open your eyes to a certain topic, you things are coming to you. You know, it's just like you see more and more artists and curators interesting in Pasolini and you have the feeling, okay, why is it? Why are there so many artists and curators being interested in Pasolini at the moment? Why do they make the artworks? And there are many, I mean, this show could have been far bigger uh, in a way because there is so much. And uh, why are they going back? Why is there a certain reenactment? I mean, Lily is a reenactment and she transferred it to a different uh, reality. There are many reenactments um, at the moment. Uh, so why is it? What makes it so interesting or maybe appealing? Um, and this is an open question. I don't have a theory, but uh, we put the question out there and what I'm hoping for that there's a certain discussion and we try to contextualize it. Um, and especially Benjamin worked hard on it to, to really make all the different um, artworks visible, to make Pasolini visible, to, to give the audience um, an idea of what it could be, what a discourse could be, what a discussion could be. And we have all these different um, um, different works. What I realize now is is really that um, many of the works really also talk about his death and the last two days um, of his life. And what is for me when 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 we talked about it first and also today is when I had to learn his last the, the lines of his last interview, and he said, "We are all in danger." This is, was for me the most remarkable thing. Um, because we are, I think there is a feeling of being in danger all over at the moment. That's also why we like autocrats right now, or many people like autocrats right now. 
there is a danger of something, a fear for something that is falling apart and nobody has an idea what could come tomorrow in a way. And um, on the other side, uh, maybe there is a danger. Maybe there is a danger of climate change. Maybe there is a danger of um, losing democracy in a way. And, and this is something he said, and he said it in a very, with a very open mind and was just sitting there and was also thinking and, and didn't, didn't define it clearly, but was just like, okay, it is the moment and the feeling. And this is what, what for me is, is, is the most, most important thing. And then you have all these artists, I mean, Nina Fischer and Marwan Elzani, they have the photo works, they're gonna show it in a slide projector. And last week, they, um, somebody took sound recordings at the place at Ostia. So where Pasolini died. So you have all these images of a documentary project and then um, the sound piece. Or um, you have this Fabian's yours. I mean, it's also, it's not only, it's, it's really about culture. It's not only fine artists of works by artists who are really in the, in the art context or in the art market. It's far broader, which is interesting. Um, if we have the allegories, um, we have these old pictures and then Susanne Sachse and Mark Siegel are reading, uh, are reading the text and you can sit there and listen. Uh, this is absolutely, um, this is absolutely amazing in a way. Or Julian Cole, um, who brings in Derek Jarman and, and or Elisabetta Benassi, who also has a reenactment of Pasolini and tries to bring it to contemporary times. It's just like, um, a huge, um, um, I'm, I'm just interested what it does, um, what it does to people if it could start or could start um, an argument or a discussion or um, what can it be? And this is also with, with political art. I mean, Dieter Röstrette, the curator said once, um, if art doesn't do politics, who will? And um, for me, it's like an arena on where you can discuss or tackle topics and where you can open, um, open a public discourse in a way. And I don't know if it works. I have no idea. It's just an option. <laughs> it's an option you could use. And, and maybe it's somebody, it's, it's also something weird that it's there and, and I'm looking at it and just like, okay, um, um, does it have something to do with me or not? Um, the, I, I don't know. Um, I think this artistic engagement in all the pieces is interesting. The artistic engagement in, 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 in the ideas of Pasolini and also in the conflictual ideas of Pasolini even when we have Milo Rao who put it on a, on a theater stage. And um, I'm, yeah, I'm interested, I'm interested if it works. I mean, I'm really sorry that we can't be there tomorrow. It's just uh, very, very unfortunate um, because it would have been interesting um, um, to speak to people and to understand, um, to understand the atmosphere. And I think Stanimir, you have to tell us in a way, um, please, if you could do that um, to do so, because it's so um, it's so uh, difficult. And what I also hope is that um, it's somehow diagnostic and poetical in a way, as I said before, for me, um, in the beginning, Pasolini was an aesthetical phenomenon. I was interested films how he showed emotions um, or structured or used the camera and so on and this is equally uh, important for me i mean I, maybe this is a point where we could also start a discussion i don't want to repeat myself too much you know it's it's uh, perfectly fine thank you very much bettina i think um we we do not
comments uh, from Fabian to what Stanimir said and, and perhaps uh, vice versa too. Um, but I think that one point you mentioned, Bettina, is very important. The fact to realize that a lot of the artworks actually center around um, a reconstruction of Pasolini's person, his body and his death, in a way I think um, show how Pasolini's own death has become emblematic for the endangerment of a certain intellectual stance, uh, or to put it in other words, that perhaps the engaged intellectual today has become endangered again or even more than at Pasolini's time. And this is something that rejoins what Fabien alluded to earlier in his statement, Jean-Paul Sartre's um, sort of image of, of the engaged intellectual who embraces his time, um, embrasser son époque, which is perhaps a duty that um, an intellectual should feel towards the society and politics that surround him, but which is of course a crucial question, um, is such engaged intellectualism possible today? Um, do you have any comments to each other? Um, Fabien, I saw you nodding your head or um, um, perhaps not um, when Stanimir was um, uh, well stating his um, opinion on Pasolini being wrong not only about uh, certain levels of consumerism criticism, but also on his take on um, uh, pre-modernity. Uh, do you want to do you want to uh, answer to that? Well, maybe more than to answer, I was just I wanted to to um, um, express my. Uh, I mean, what what about the. Uh, um, the antiquity vision of Pasolini, I think we perf perfectly agree about this. It is like a m mystification and mythification of past time. And this is, um, of course, this um, has no tie to realism. It's like a counter world that uh, Pasolini projects and it's like, like a, um, a mental refugee um, camp for him. And it, it is problematic. I think that's. Uh, I, I perfectly agree with with uh, with Stanimir. I, I, I want, do not want to go into the personal opinions um, of Stanimir, although I would be interested to hear more about um, his criticism to Pasolini's criticism on on cons and the consumist cons consumer uh, con culture. But I w just want to say I found it very interesting to hear Stanimir say Pasolini was wrong about this because I think this is, this is possible. I don't know, I don't want to, I don't want to argue this. Um, I personally don't think from a Western point of view that he was wrong about his uh, um, uh, consumed criticism. I, I think he, he was perfectly right about it, um, associate, associating it to um, a process of alienation which is continuing and which brings us to another point of view. But maybe this is, this is more realistic to see it like this and maybe we have to um, step back and, 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 uh, um, and stop to be moral by um, observing what is happening now. But what I wanted to say more is like, I, I found it very interesting to hear Stanimir say that he was wrong or, or right about something because this is one thing that in the Pasolini reception, um, is happening often, it's happening very often in Italy. So you have like the one person who say Pasolini is the perfect prophet, he, he saw everything, he saw Berlusconi, he saw the, um, the end and the crumbling of the First Republic, um, he saw everything. Um, and then there are the other ones who say he was wrong about this and this and this. Um, just for example, he was obviously, I think, wrong saying that um, in 1779, that in 10 or 20 years, Russia will be the perfect place to live in. I personally don't think that it's, uh, that, that this is ob objective. So, so this is maybe something that, that could be, that could be um, discussed. But for maybe the problem is um, that we discuss Pasolini much more as a social, sociological philosopher um, or like a, a politician who is um, forced to given some directions 
um, and we afterwards judge in terms of right or wrong. But this is not, I don't think this, that this is the right um, approach to, to Pasolini. I think actually the quintessence of his work is, as I said, is a metaphorical one. And by, by, um, by the time you use metaphors, you leave the terrain, the, 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 the level of uh, the possibility to say yes or no. So um, it's actually very, uh, very ambiguous or very difficult, I think, um, to judge Pasolini in base of um, his prognostic were right or wrong. What really um, interests me is how his prognostic continues to um, stimulate minds. And actually you can read them in, in very several, in, in several uh, perspectives. And just for instance, um, you have his last film, Salon, um, which is, uh, which has the uh, renomme of, of, of some kind of shocker or some kind of terrible film, uh, which um, demonstrates uh, the, the ugliness of, of uh, fascist power. And of course, this is one possible um, perspective to read it and to interpret it. But on the other hand side, if you go deeper into the structure and the aesthetical structure of the film, you, um, you come back, you come out of it, of this experience and you lose um, the possibility to judge in terms of right, wrong, left, right. It's, 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 it's very confusing. It's, as I said, it's um, profoundly ambivalent. So I think we have to um, maybe um, leave the, um, the um, so sociological side of Pasolini, the, the, the intellectual or professor side of Pasolini um, besides, and we, we have to focus more on, on the open structure of his, of his pictures and of his metaphors. That's, my, my personal opinions. Mm -hmm. Stanimir, would you agree? Um, I think uh, Fabian's approach is, um, no, I don't agree. <laughs> Fabian's <laughs> approach is, uh, is actually uh, an impoverishment of, uh, of Pasolini's work. Uh, listen, I think somebody like Pasolini is, uh, in his essence, uh, a paresia, somebody who tells the truth. And I don't think uh, disengaging from categories uh, right and wrong is, uh, um, um, is, is useful for, for that very simple reason. I mean, uh, the other reason for that, uh, the other reason for that is that um, uh, I've seen this in many accounts on Pasolini. Um, he offered a critique of Western bourgeoisie so uh, it's not okay to just speak about consumerism. There are just, just a cluster of terms and phenomena that they, they go together. Uh, he sees, he, he, he maintains a critique of what the Western bourgeoisie, including the Western left at the time, uh, and it's at the various stages in Italy and abroad, uh, from a very Western-centric centric perspective. I don't, I don't think it's a scandal to say that. I think it's okay. I think it's okay to, uh, for somebody like Pasolini or his readers to embrace even that. Um, the fact that he, he did see third worldism as an option uh, uh, or else doesn't essentially change his perspective. If you ask Sartre whether Sartre saw himself as an, as, as an orthodox Marxist, he wouldn't agree with that. But nevertheless, a lot of people see him as an orthodox writer. So uh, in much the same way, I think uh, Pasolini is quite uh, Euro, Eurocentric and even Eurocommunist at, at times uh, in, 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 in his analysis and critique. And the, the essence and the crux of my argument uh, about being right and wrong about consumerism is that the um, you know the Western, uh, the, the Western Marxist uh, analysis uh, of the Frankfurt School type, um, etc., uh, on, um, uh, on 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 Western society alone is inebriated by by this inferiority complex of the Western left. Uh, that you know, by the 1930s, the Western uh, proletariat was left alone. You know there wasn't a political representation uh, analogous to what happened in the USSR and the satellite countries. And this is an inferiority complex maintained to this very day in the contemporary Western lefts. 
um, left movement. And I, and I think it's not it's not a problem to acknowledge that 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 that, that Pasolini had had also an option that's close to this one. Um, uh, the problem with the critique of consumerism was that if you ask any critique of Eastern European socialism, is precisely that uh, consumerism was was a, was was just a different term for aesthetic survival, if you will. You know, the, to 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 exist without civil liberties and to exist without the opportunity to wear more than three types of jeans at best in the 1980s is, 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 is extremely different from, from, from what uh, Pasolini would have imagined. I'm not trying to say he doesn't, he didn't know of these issues. I just, I just think that we have to be honest about um, the, the Western imaginary of what was happening in the East. And I'm sorry if I construed this as an East-Western uh, opposition. I understand that this is much more complicated and there are gray areas. But, uh, but 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 this is essentially uh, this is essentially my point that in, in you know disengaging uh, him from from the Eurocentric eye is uh, is is also a missed opportunity. But uh, I think uh, the uh, the one point that the two of you actually share is that both of you want to argument against a reduction of Pasolini, and. Yes. <laughs> So um, to take up a notion that Bettina brought up, um, we again come back to the dichotomy of, um, of Pasolini's potential. Um, we unfortunately do not have much time left. Um, Bettina, do you want to make a last remark be be before I start wrapping up? Uh, I would just like to say thank you. <laughs> Great, this is a wonderful remark. Everybody. I join in in, in thanking. Um, Thank there's, there's not much more to say. Um, I think we all feel that this discussion could carry on a further at least one and a half hours. And uh, personally, I'm very sad because I feel that it's becoming very interesting right now. Um, unfortunately, with regard to, to time and also with regard to the ongoing events in Sofia, we uh, should keep this discussion in a certain time frame. I just want to um, use the opportunity to again remind that the exhibition opening of After Pasolini, Visions of Today, will take place at the Ancient Bath in Plovdiv tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. And uh, that the recording of this discussion can be found on Facebook. Uh, so please share with your friends. And um, that, um, yeah, as uh, Stefka said at the opening, of this discussion, please keep posted on Goethe Institute Sofia's homepage and the webpage of the Art Today Association of Plovdiv for further content that will go with this exhibition. And thank you all for taking part in this discussion. Again, Stanimir, Fabien, Bettina, thank you very much. And Stefka, thank you. And the Goethe Institute in Sofia for inviting us. And of course, I'm joining uh, the, the thinking on behalf of the Goethe Institute. And uh, uh, besides the recording of this of uh, this discussion on the Facebook uh, in the Facebook event, you will also find uh, Stanimir Panayotov's um, bibliography with uh, all the information and all the uh, all the publications about Pasolini in Bulgarian language. Um, and uh, I again want to invite you all to uh, come also to the exhibition to the 26th uh, week of contemporary art in Plovdiv curated this year by Bettina Steinbrücke and uh, Benjamin Feldman is, uh, uh, is the past 25 exhibitions so far. <laughs> this one also asks many questions and it's definitely one of the most important and most interesting events for contemporary art in, in Bulgaria. And if you haven't been to Plovdiv for the week of contemporary art yet, maybe not this year, but next year would be a good occasion to come. And thank you all again. And uh, we're looking forward to see the exhibition tomorrow at 7 p.m. in Plovdiv. Ciao and have a nice evening. Oh, thank you.